Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute espresso shot episodes, served with a dash of personality. I am Hazel Baker, CEO of London Guided Walks, providing private tours, treasure hunts and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. To accompany this podcast, we also have hundreds of London history related blog posts for you to enjoy at londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash blog. Now, we have some exciting news this week, but we don't have one piece of news. Oh, no, we actually have two. The first one was that this week I was a guest on BBC Radio London with Robert Elms talking about the King's Wardrobe, a wonderful, a very quiet, historic area within the city of London. And it's somewhere that we visit also on our tours of Blackfriars, the best of Blackfriars. And I'll pop the link to that in the show notes. The second piece of news is from Saturday the 4th of July, we will be back um, offering private tours and treasure hunts, all COVID-19 secure. As we prepare to reopen, we are offering a £15 discount for all private tours booked online from now until the 4th of July. No promo code is required. We've done all the hard work for you. Simply go to londonguidedwalks.co.uk, click on private tours in the menu, choose a London tour and book securely online. Tours with this offer can be booked for up until December 2020. You just need to book before the 4th of July to benefit from the £15 discount. And for the regulars amongst you, you already know we don't normally offer discounts. So make sure you don't miss out. And now on with the show. I don't know about you, but I feel a flurry of excitement when sorting through the post and I receive something non-bill related. When was the last time you received a postcard? I do love the idea that someone has taken the time, money and effort to choose, write and post a postcard to me. I suppose social media and its ability to post photos and connect multiple people at the click of a button for free has helped um, diminish this once seemingly compulsory vacation ritual. And if receiving personal posts feels so good, why do we not send more too? Joining me today is author Helen Baggett, who has written a rather intriguing book called Posted in the Past, and it's revealing the true stories written on a postcard. She meticulously collects these stories and researches them, showing us the real lives of real people. And today she's going to be sharing some of the stories and the research behind those stories of some London-related postcards. So, Helen, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. How did you start going down this rabbit hole? Well, it's one of those those situations where you're not looking for a hobby, but something actually finds you. And it began 20 or so years ago with a couple of postcards that my father bought. And one of them was sent to a soldier in 1913. And I just decided to try and discover some more about his life. And very sadly, he was killed during the First World War. And I just felt that as important as it is, and in fact, it's essential to remember that someone has given their life in a war, it's also important to remember the life they lost and also perhaps the life that was never going to follow on for them. And so just researching uh, from one postcard, uh, A Soldier's Short Life, it just led me on to, to researching more because it was such a satisfying project which connected me with his family in America and in this country and is still revealing more information that I never expected to, to hear about. So that's what started me off on the project. I think it's brilliant. And you've got some stories that you're wanting to to share with us today. Yes, yes, I have. Uh, The postcards that I've researched, uh, I've probably researched possibly 300 by now, but they were all sent from around the world to addresses in this country. But the ones I've chosen to talk about uh, have, have a London connection. And the first one was sent to an address in Clapham Common, Uh, sent to a a Winnie Purnell who lived in Ballingdon Road and the postcard was sent in 1909 and it was sent from a friend named Gladys. 
Winnie was celebrating her birthday and Gladys had been invited by Winnie's mother to uh, come along and have a slice of cake with Sue. But unfortunately, Gladys had to decline because her parents needed her at home. And I think this offers an insight into the lives of young women in the early years of the 20th century. As much as Gladys wanted to go and help her friend celebrate her birthday at an informal afternoon tea with her friend's house, Gladys's parents didn't want her to go and so she was unable to go, which I think offers something of a, a sad tint to a celebration perhaps. So when I've researched Winnie, who received the postcard, I looked at census returns and that shows me the employment and where people lived at that time. And in Winnie's case, she lived, as we know, in in Clapham Common. But her father's employment shows us how job descriptions have changed over the times. He was at various times involved in the fitting of sanitary appliances someone we today would call a plumber. And it just demonstrates how the terminology has changed. Uh, Though Winnie lived in London, her her mother was from Wiltshire. And of course, we never know why someone has moved around the country. But they settled in London anyway, and that's where Winnie and her siblings grew up. Later, I found the family in Merton Park. And by this time, Winnie had married Charles Smith. And he sent her a birthday card, which I also have. And this was sent in the 1930s. And accessing the 1939 register, I was able to discover information about the neighbours. And it's quite interesting what jobs these people had in Merton Park. This was quite a nice area, and it's still a nice area today. We had a senior sanitary inspector working for the borough of Chelsea an executive officer with HM Customs and Excise, a retired police sergeant, a publisher with the Daily Mirror, uh, a chief inspector of the Metropolitan Police. It's also interesting that the young women who were living with their families at this time at these addresses, if they were in employment, they were all secretarial work. All of the other employment jobs that I've listed are for the fathers, for the husbands in the households. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like you were saying about a sanitary fitter and yeah. known as a plumber now. <laughs> yeah, sanitary apl- appliances. And of course, you can imagine at this time in the early 1900s, you know, people still had out- outside toilets. I mean, they would have for quite a long time after this date. But these modern conveniences that we take for granted today this was all starting to happen for people. Yeah. I also like the the terminology, the language used in these uh, postcards as well. I mean, it's, it's evident that someone didn't write it today. With love from your affectionate friend, Gladys. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, the postcard that her husband sends to her, uh, even though they're living at the same address and it wasn't posted, and I, and I can imagine him leaving it for her on the mantelpiece, perhaps. Um, you know, my dearest Winifred, wishing you very many happy returns of your birthday with fondest love from Charlie. It's so sweet. It's that, I think that's one of my favourite postcard stories that I've researched. And I have to admit that in my mind's eye, Winifred is a character from one of those films, you know, that depict the era of the 1930s in London. Celia John- Johnson, perhaps, in This Happy Breed. That's who I see as Winnie. <laughs> And I love the handwriting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, some of it you can hardly read, but others, it's absolutely beautiful. And I mean, one postcard I had researched, which was sent from a young man to the lady I later discovered he was he, he married. His handwriting is beautiful. And the message was written in red ink. So passionate. And it, and it finished with six kisses. Oh, I say, how extravagant. Well, I was going to say, I don't think my uh, my husband leaves me notes. Maybe, yeah, this uh, episode will uh, prompt him into a bit of action. <laughs> so you have, uh, so that's a lovely one of Clapham Common and Merton Park together. And you've got one for uh, Balham, I believe. Yes, I have. Lynn Street in Balham, which was sent to Doris, Doris Wilson, who was uh, a young girl at this time. And the postcard was sent from someone who has just signed their name H. Grant. And I, and I don't know whether 
that's a child, although the handwriting suggests that it would be. At this time, Doris was, I think, 10 or, 10 or 11. And so perhaps this person um, who sent the card was perhaps a little bit older, but not much older than, than her. And this is a lovely card. Well, the message tells us that they were both postcard collectors. And the person who sent the card has said that they thank Doris for sending the card and that they would very much like the set. So they were obviously sending each other postcards that would go into a collection. The message goes on to say that I came to London with father a fortnight ago and went to the exhibition. So we know that the postcard, because of the date on it, was sent in October 1910. And uh, looking at what exhibitions were on in London at this time, we have the Japanese-British exhibition, which was held in White City in London. Now that ran from May to October in 1910, and the postcard was sent in the early days of October. So that's likely to be the exhibition that this person, this child, had been taken to. This idea of the exhibitions in London comes through in several postcards where people have visited, and they covered a vast area, acres and acres of exhibition space. And in this particular one in White City, one book referenced that more than 8 million people have visited. And um, that's a vast, vast area and a huge audience. Uh, when you think today that perhaps you, if you had an exhibition in the perhaps the O2 arena, I, I don't know. I think it would have to be indoors these days. 8 million. I think that's a fantastic, fantastic amount of, of people to attend. And the idea of the exhibitions actually carries on into another card, which was sent to Jersey, Channel Islands, but it was sent from the recipient's sister. It was sent to somebody called Annie. The message just says, can you fancy us here at the exhibition in London? We are staying with friends and our address for the week is in the Strand, Grove Park Road, Chiswick. And this card actually has quite a nice story attached to it that happened after the, the book I've written was published because I had a contact from somebody who was descended from another sister and she was the, the granddaughter of another sister. There were three sisters. Of course, it was fascinating for her to see what her great aunts were up to at this time. The exhibition they'd gone to was the Festival of the Empire, which was held at Crystal Palace in London, and that celebrated the coronation of George V. Now, that opened in May 1911, and, of course, uh, these people had gone along in June of 1911 to see it. So there were people travelling all around to go and see these spectacles, and when I was chatting with the, the niece of the two sisters who sent and received the postcards, you know, we both agreed that... It just offered a glimmer into their lives because you would never know that these people had attended the exhibition, but you have the evidence in the message on the postcard. Very often, if you've got the handwriting on another document, you can match the people off. It helps if in 1911 they were the head of a household because they would have completed the census return in their own handwriting. And, and I've actually matched the handwriting to people and then being able to say with 100% certainty that they are the person who sent the postcard. In one instance, uh, it was very clear from a message that the person lived relatively close by and they'd gone away and, and they'd suggested to the person they sent the card that they could go and pick the beans if they if they were looking ripe in the garden. And that suggested to me that they, they, they couldn't have lived that far apart. And so I walked down the road using the census return. And thankfully, this person who sent the postcard was the head of the household. And so I was able to match the handwriting. Then I was able to say with certainty that this is the person that sent the postcard even though there was nothing on the postcard which would actually tell me who they were oh you miss marple <laughs> that is an aspect that i have enjoyed and i've done it more than once i mean looking at this postcard to uh, miss marcus to, uh, to annie the photo itself is very grand isn't it and uh, in, and on the back of it it says that it's actually the uh, uh, an official postcard 
of the coronation exhibition. And then looking at the actual stamp, the mail stamp, that's the coronation exhibition mail stamp as well. So I can imagine this, very similar to what I did when I was 11 at Disney World, is buying the postcard, very excitedly writing it, sticking the stamp on, and then queuing up to, you know, to get it uh, stamped properly and, and so it'd have Mickey Mouse's head on it, you know. And this is what you've got here, a little experience. You haven't bought it and then uh, written it later on. This was bought, written and posted right there as she was experiencing it. Yeah, isn't that a lovely touch? I think that's another aspect of that particular story, which makes it so, so special. Very often, the postcards don't connect with the view on, on the card. Uh, people were buying packs of postcards because they were using them so often. They were sending perhaps several a day. They bought a pack and you would find that there is no connection with the image on the card to where the person is at that time. I have a postcard that was uh, sent by somebody in Wales and it's of Stirling in Scotland. And the only reason that can have happened is because they had it with them and they just wanted to send a message home to say they'd arrived safely. So they'd, they'd obviously carried this, this pack of postcards with them. I mean, I must admit, Helen, I have a drawer absolutely packed full of emergency birthday cards and blank cards. And uh, whenever I go to dinner or stay at the friends for a weekend or whatever, when I get home, I then write a little thank you card. Or if someone's been unwell and I write them a little note and, you know, it might be of a peacock, not, nothing uh, that you would expect to, you know, pop it into Clinton's. Um, people say how old fashioned I am for sending a thank you card. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I didn't think it was old fashioned. I just thought it was good manner. <laughs> I think it's lovely. And if you think today, when we go on holiday, when we're allowed to go on holiday, you can upload your photographs onto one of the platforms. And within seconds, people at home can see what you're doing on your holiday. There's no need to send a postcard. Why would you? But if you think about it, you're missing out on the ephemera, the piece of card that you can hold that connects you with whatever's happened in the past and how that has reached into somebody else's hands 100 years later. You're not going to get quite that sense of excitement with a Facebook memory coming up. That is a very good point. And of course, this postcard is as close as you're going to get, not just with it being bought, written and posted there, but even when she says, can you fancy us here at the exhibition in London? It's as close as she got to uh, a sel sending a selfie. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't you just love the words she's used? You can hear the excitement. Yeah. It comes through yeah. in, in that. Yeah, no, I think it's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Helen, for taking the time out with us today. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and also Winnie and Edith and Ethel and Freddie and all these wonderful names. <laughs> aren't, aren't they lovely? I, in my mind's eye, they're all looking at us and, and, and smiling. <laughs> I appreciate it, Helen. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Hazel. I hope you've all enjoyed today's episode and if you have then please do take a few minutes to leave a review. This not only helps me making sure that I'm on the right tracks and delivering what you want but also for those who haven't listened to the podcast before and want to know whether it's worth their time. As with every episode that we do, you can check out the show notes, which has links to recommended reading, including Helen's book posted in the past, but also um, the, has the transcript. So if you prefer to read things rather than listen to them. Don't forget, we have hundreds of blog posts writing about places in London, very often that we visit or discuss in our private London tours. And don't forget that we are now offering £15 off all private tours booked until the 4th of July and you can book your private tour all the way up to December 2020. So no promo code required, just check londonguidedwalks.co.uk and click on private tours and book securely online. They, we are all COVID-19 secure. Uh, we also have a statement uh, on the website uh, sharing uh, what we're going to do to make sure that not only you but also our staff um, are as safe as possible as well so thanks very much for listening and i'll catch you next week mm -hmm.